you reading your own book? Yeah, it's good stuff, this. Very good stuff. I was reading it because uh, our next guest was mm. a valued contributor to this. Helena Norberg-Hodge came on and advised us about a little thing called localism that I hadn't heard of then. Helena Norberg-Hodge is the world's grandmother who, along with figures like Vandana Shiva, believes that we should be empowered to run our own communities and that localism is the answer to the centralised power that is currently introducing tyranny to every corner of the globe. It's Helena Norberg-Hodge. Are you there, Helena? I'm here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Helena. You look really, really well. The first question I want to ask you is, do you believe truly that localism, that any kind of community-oriented, democratic organisation can provide an antidote to WEF-style top-down control that we're seeing increasing? We're seeing an increase in authoritarianism. Tony Blair's got real pep in his step now. Do you think that people can take back control of their communities? Is there a real alternative? There's absolutely a real alternative, and I think the only obstacle is that people haven't heard that much about it. We need this paradigm shift, you know, we need to put on different lenses. And when we do, we will see that localism is actually happening right under our noses, but it needs a lot more support, needs a lot more people to see it as the systemic alternative to what's going on as our governments have been handing over power to global corporations and banks systematically, almost since the inception of the modern economy. It's been about supporting the global traders and the global banks to the detriment of the local, regional, and national. But now it's reaching these proportions that are dead end. We've really got to wake up to it. Helena, the mainstream media continually bludgeon us with the grim fact that there are no alternatives to globalist corporatism, that we have no hope but to hand over to some AI dystopia where big tech and big pharma and big business bludgeon ordinary people the world over into submission while we're lost in an endless and unwinnable culture war. Can you give us, therefore, examples of localism working? I, first of all, I can give you hundreds of millions, actually billions of people who are not yet so entrapped in that global system. And they are the people who are less developed. A lot of them are not doing that well because they've been colonized and before that enslaved for a long time. But, you know, I had that amazing privilege of entering a culture, you know, in the mid 70s that had not been colonized, that had also not been shaped by missionaries. It was an independent culture in the Himalayas, Ladakh, West Tibet. And I learned to speak the language fluently and I discovered a world where people were independent, but Russell, not as individual sovereign Ident, you know, individual identities, they were independent as communities. We've always evolved in community and we need one another. So there, I discovered what it means when you have plenty of people, every time you sow a field, every time you harvest, every time you build a house, plenty of people. For every baby, 10 caretakers, Imagine what a paradise that would be for the mothers of today who are sitting there doing this unnatural thing of dealing with an infant that needs 24-7 care. So anyway, I discovered that localized reality, which was not, as I say, some individuals going off and trying to do it on their own. I met the happiest, healthiest people I've ever encountered. Later on, I worked in Bhutan, found a very similar thing. And by the way, it's Schumacher's 50th anniversary of his book, Small is Beautiful. And he was a highly respected conventional economist who ended up in Burma in the 60s. And he ended up having to change his whole view on economics because he also found in Burma there was no unemployment, there was no poverty. Now, all of these cultures I'm talking about were Buddhist. And this may have something to do with that they were exceptionally well-balanced cultures. But anyway, the reality is in small ways all around the less developed world, not in the West, cities there. Inside the Western world, what you will see if you put on these localist lenses or what, you know, yeah, what we call also micro-trends, 
Everywhere in the West, you will find, if you go close to the ground, you'll find examples of local people coming together to create local food system, to create local community-based um, hospice centers, to create locally-based midwife and natural birth centers, to create healthy medicine centers. And you will see in every instance that it works better. It's more efficient. People are able to see the specifics of the individuals they deal with, the ecosystem they're living in. It's about adapting to the reality of diversity. So localism is a must. What's happening as we're being taken away, step by step, further from nature, from our bodies, from the soil, into the metaverse. And unfortunately, a lot of people believe that this is going to be better than what we have in real life. And it's because real life has been made to be so shitty that people now believe the metaverse may be an improvement. Right, we've been so stripped of hope, so desiccated of the, the wet joy of being human and being part of nature that the idea of being strapped into some virtual machine, experiencing reality on some internal screen starts to seem appealing. Helena, of course, you're joining us for our three-day event community along with Vandana Shiva and Wim Hof and a whole host of others. Very, very excited that you'll be joining us there. There's a link in the description if you want to get tickets to see that and believe me they are going fast so get them now i'm very interested to hear that everywhere around us there are examples of localism community real democracy people cooperating and it's interesting to see how hard the centralized forces work at ensuring that these stories are not proliferated that we're drained of the optimism that we're denied the possibility of seeing that there are alternative systems it's absolutely vital that these stories are told, even though sometimes by the nature of these stories, they feel local, parochial, small. Isn't, this is not a glistening Apple store shining at you from the middle of Manhattan. This is not one of those ridiculous M&M stores that seem to be in every major city in the world. But it's becoming pretty clear now that the model of consumerism isn't working. Being cast in the role of a consumer, buying products, sugary products, dumb dumbs, reflective screens to stare at in perpetuity, uh, these ideas aren't working anymore. What we need are meaning, connection, purpose. You can see there's a crisis in masculinity, a crisis in femininity, a crisis in community, and the answers are to return somehow to our nature. But with a new mentality, with the deployment of some of the principles that you're espousing. When you come to speak to us at Community, will you talk us through things that we can do right now when it comes to protesting and when it comes to pre presenting viable, viable alternatives, in particular, Helena, with bridging the evident and growing gap between poor people and rich people. Oxfam have just done a st study on how inequality is growing. We know that there's a billionaire elite class now. You know, they're coming for the middle class now. Middle class people are going to be drained of their resources. This is going to affect everyone. We're not just talking about old school bleeding hearts, liberalism, or we've got to help people, help people that are worse off than ourselves. This is going to be a crisis that where there's only there's the elite class and then there's the rest of us scrabbling around in real life hunger games. Yeah, but I also wouldn't put it that way. I wouldn't say they are coming from the middle class. I really think we have to say that we've got a de facto conspiracy. It's a structural conspiracy where our leaders from left to right to middle in every country I know, including my native country, Sweden, they've been going along with a dogma, econometric thinking, removed from nature, removed from people's needs, and, and you know, growth increases with cancer, growth increases with pollution. When the water is so polluted, we have to buy it in bottles. It's good for the economy. We have a lot of good people going along with that dogma. And yes, they are marginalizing and impoverishing virtually every human being on this planet. And a tiny, tiny minority, ever smaller, is winning. I worked with economists already 30 years ago who were documenting how in America between the 60s and the 90s, the average American had to work one month more per year to stay in place. 
I worked with an English economist who did the same thing in England, and he was just looking at it in terms of spending power. It was called the growth illusion. And he was saying, the economy is growing, but you're getting poorer. But Russell, the problem was we could not get these things out into the media. I helped to set up something called an International Forum on Globalization. I introduced Vandana and other colleagues from the Global South to a funder who then honed a, a whole process that we had for about 20 years, trying to raise awareness about how the globalizing economy was leading to poverty across the world. We had Tony Blair and all these you know, left-leaning prime ministers telling us, oh, no, we're doing this, you know, don't be selfish. We've got to move our industries to China. If you care about poor people, you just be quiet. Now, what we need more than anything to bring about the change is you, Russell, and more like you. It's amazing what you're doing, creating another platform, reaching people with the big picture from the whole vital understanding of what it means to feel more connected through spiritual practice, but also that connection if we're just sitting meditating alone in a cement box room in a high-rise building, no connection to other people, no connection to nature, we won't get that full-fledged embodied spirituality that we all long for. We evolve connected to people and to nature, to the animals, to seeing the sky, to having some trees around us. And that removal from nature, even in Sweden, by the 70s, had led to depression, epidemics of, of, of alcoholism, and yet... Scandinavia was held up as this model of progress. So we've got to go deep and look at why is this happening? It's not just Bill Gates now has had these ideas or Klaus Schwab. It's been going on for a longer time. And I think what's really good about seeing that is that we don't really need to talk so much about individuals. We need to be talking about the systemic divergent path. If you go along with these new techno greenwashed ideas, you're supporting a system that's basically destroying life. And you can, we can show, Russell, we can show that exactly the same policies that day by day make fewer and fewer people mega rich and everybody else poorer. Those same policies are driving up emissions, destroying you know, creating climate change, but also decimating biodiversity. They are linked, and the thing that's being done is everyone is being pushed into a specialized, narrow view and a narrow cause. So whether it's gender, whether it's rich, poor, whether it's handicapped or not handicapped, whether it's global south, global north, we're being divided. And what localism does in a holistic way by understanding that it's a process that's diametrically opposed to the globalizing corporate path. It's about do we want corporations to run our lives and our communities or do we want communities to run them? But that doesn't mean that we don't need the nation state right now. Ideally, what we'd be doing is coming together with a strong enough voice so that we will only have representatives at the top that are saying we are no longer going to be enslaved to the corporate system of oppression and destruction. We are taking back that power and we are handing power immediately down to the best level. And for most things that we need, it can be very localized. But we need the protection of coming together in order to withstand the power of the corporation. Helena, thank you for praising that complex idea into such a succinct and rousing answer. Uh, thank you again for being such a fantastic teacher. Thank you for the long pilgrimage you have made, for making this information accessible and for carrying this strong, radical, anti-establishment message that is necessary, pragmatic, plausible and possible to our audience. And we'll do everything we can to highlight your message to as many people as possible and to ensure that the 
the right people hear it. And that's all of us. That's you watching this right now. I'm talking directly to you. You can join me and Helena at Community 2023, our free day festival in Hay on Wye. Go to russellbrand.com right now to participate in this incredible event. Helena, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing can you. Can I there. just, I want to say something really important, Russell. Can I? Yeah. We're having a big gathering in Bristol, end of September this year, end of September. We're gathering a tribe from all around the world, every continent, to give a big voice to the local. And we're hoping that you're going to be joining us. We've got amazing people, many of whom... Give me the, if you say, Helena, I've got to wrap up the show, but send me a link to it. We'll post it everywhere. We'll put it on all of the platforms where people watch us and stuff. We'll make sure that we, right. we'll, we'll, we'll uh, support your event in September. Please Bristol. support that. It's, it's unique. It's unique. And we have sent a link. Bless you. We'll sort it out. Helena, thank you very much.